I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club, and I'm really happy to introduce now the second day of our event, Hate News, Manipulators, Trolls, and Influencers, as part of our Misinformation Ecosystem Series, part one. <laughs> and so, I mean, I already see that you are sitting here close to me, so I will keep, you, keep it uh, quite short, but first I want to thank my wonderful collaborators, Kim Foss, Nada Bakker, Rael Verer, and also Jonas Franchi. Um, and of course, I want to thank all the people in the public that uh, join us today. I want also to thank our funders, the Senat Verwaltung for Kultur on Europa, the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation, and the Friedrich Heber Stiftung, and also our cooperation partners, the Kunstrand Kreuzberg Betanien Spectrum, where we will do an event tomorrow, so please join us. And we are working in collaboration with the Wow Holland Stiftung, the Rogue Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation, and the Alexander from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And our media partners are Ex Berliner and Furterfield. So I briefly just would like to introduce uh, the day of uh, this program uh, of today and then also introduce our wonderful moderator. Um, so today uh, we are answering to the question of the relationship between the deliberate sp spreading of hate online and political manipulation. And uh, in particular, we want to focus on the ideology that is uh, behind hate speech. So we are covering uh, hate campaigns, also violence and sexual assault online and offline, and also trying to understand the general causes that led to the spreading of hate speech as political and social phenomena. And I think it's also really important always to keep in mind in a sense that the idea of misinformation is really an ecosystem, so it's not just about uh, hate or about, uh, you know, political manipulation and targeting, but it's really a layer of uh, several phenomena that are interviewing. So today is also really important to understand in which way uh, this kind of cultural war is created as part of the phenomenon of uh, political manipulation, and also um, hate speech. Um, so, uh, we start now with our keynote. The title is Uncovering Corruption on Strategic Harassment, Mexican Trolls, and Election Manipulation. And I'm really glad to welcome Andrea Noel, that is coming from Mexico, uh, and Renata Avila from Guatemala, that is going to moderate this keynote. So I want to say also a bit uh, of introduction about Renata. She is a human rights and tech lawyer um, and is a member of the German Whistleblower Network. She is specialized in the intellectual property and technology. Uh, and especially she is focusing on the crucial intersection between human rights, information technology, and also power disparities between the global north and the south. She's also part of the board of Creative Commons, and at the moment uh, she's based between Belgrade and Guatemala, writing a book about digital colonialism. So thanks very, very much, uh, Renata, for being here, and also Andrea, and I leave the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I, I think that I feel a lot of responsibility in this panel because we are representing um, women in a continent uh, from north to south that is in a, engaged in a war against women. And it is, it is a war against women's bodies. It is a war against women's, women's minds. It is a war where uh, either the state or your partner is actively undermining you. And is, um, I, I want to mention just, just an example. Uh, last night, uh, uh, I was reading the news after, after returning from the talk here. There was a border patrol, US border patrol shot dead a poor indigenous woman, 20 years old, dressing her traditional clothes, unarmed, 
when, while she was trying to cross the border. Then, a few, few days ago, and her name was Claudia Gomez. Then, a few, few days ago, in Mexico, Alicia Diaz, journalist covering corruption, was shot dead. Then, a few uh, uh, hundred days ago, more or less, Mariel Franco, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, defending the rights of uh, uh, marginalized communities, was shot dead as well. And not so long ago, Berta Cáceres, environmental uh, activist, was shot dead. And that's daily news. And that's um, and the example, uh, Andrea, a journalist who migrated to Mexico to cover, to, to do really radical journalism in the border in one of the most dangerous areas of Latin, in one of the hotspots of, uh, not only of Latin America, of the world, I will say it as dangerous as Iraq. Uh, she was covering the war on drugs. She was also covering the, the strong component of violence against women connected to this uh, wars and, and, and it is very interesting because if you see Andrea on the outside, she will represent in any country in Latin America the privilege. Um, um, middle class American is a uh, upper class in most of the Latin American countries and it will represent um, something that if she was a man, completely untouchable and completely sacred. But because she's a woman, I think that it is, it is, for me, like the most important part of this keynote is to understand that violence against women online and offline in Latin America is so profound that uh, crosses classes, races, nationalities, is like borderless and limitless and is only increasing. So, uh, please, Andrea, uh, uh, I, uh, we are very, very, very curious about your, your experience. Thank you, and thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to apologize in advance because some of the content that I'm gonna be covering is explicit and visceral, and um, if there's anybody who's queasy, I definitely am very sorry about that. Um, the the title of this event is very, very curious because it's almost um, custom made for what I've been doing for the last two years, two and a half years. Um, so, let's see, I'm trying to get this to work, but um, I've been focusing on hate, on news, bots, trolls, influencers, and um, that's basically what we're all here <laughs> to listen to. Um, and also a little bit of money and how it correlates to these, um, th these five topics. Um, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of news, which um, is kind of personal, and I'm gonna try and speed through the first half because it's personal, and the second half is less personal and therefore far more interesting, I think. Um, but so news, March 8th, 2016, is when I became immersed in this subject, kind of against my will. Um, I was walking down a street in Mexico City and um, somebody came up behind me and flipped up my skirt and pulled down my underwear in the middle of the street. And um, March 8th is curiously International Women's Day. So there were a lot of people who thought that it was a staged event. People didn't believe that it was real. Um, they thought that I was making it up, that it was some kind of a weird publicity stunt or I, some kind of radical feminazi was the word that was being used. Um, so people didn't buy it, but what I managed to do was get the surveillance footage, and um, I basically filmed it off of a monitor. Um, it was filmed from like 12 or 14 different angles because this happened in kind of an upper class neighborhood. We're gonna be running the video separately because of a keynote problem. Um, so basically I uploaded this video to Twitter because for the first six or seven hours, uh, people were saying that it was fake news essentially. Um, so I uploaded this video where you can see basically what happens and I asked um, my followers to help me ID the guy. And it's a really quick incident. It's three seconds that ended up derailing my life for basically um, a full six months and leaving really like a lifelong impact um, in terms of the way that I view things and the way that I think about things. Um, 
So I uploaded this tweet, just says, if anybody recognizes this idiot, please ID him. Women should be able to walk safely. Happy Women's Day. Um, and that leads us to trolls. So I started receiving these messages um, almost immediately. And they came pouring in, and I'll go ahead and translate them. This first one says, what happened to you happened because you're a woman. You're a bitch, a whore that any man can take whenever he wants. Next time, I hope that you get sodomized for being a whore. That's one. And then a, a slew of them started pouring in faster than you can scroll. It's just one after another every 10 seconds. Um, let's see. You're trash. This isn't true. Women who wear short dresses like yours deserve to be used. Um, they deserve to be raped and uh, stoned to death, just like the Bible says. Mm, women deserve to be beaten for the simple fact that they're women. They should obey their men, et cetera, et cetera. The third one talks about wanting to lick certain body parts, et cetera. So this starts happening really quickly, and they just start pouring in. Um, I continued to denounce it on my Twitter feed and um, asked my Twitter followers to help report these users that they would be suspended. I've now learned in retrospect just how futile it is to ask Twitter to do anything on <laughs> to help with this um, situation and I'm of the mind that they are absolutely useless and um, unconcerned with this subject. Um, so, these threats continued to pour in, uh, son of a whore, daughter of a whore, guns, men with bullets. I'm going to try and go through this quickly because it gets really disgusting, but I'm sorry about that. So, <laughs> um, I just felt that it's necessary for you guys to see what this actually looks like when you're receiving it, and it's gruesome, and this is just one image of thousands that are pouring in. Obviously, as a journalist who's covering the drug war and cartel violence, murdered women, murdered journalists, um, when this sort of thing happens, you have no idea why it's happening, you have no idea who it's coming from, and your mind goes in every which direction. Um, so, Initially, I didn't know if this was maybe a result of my work. I'd been covering some kind of controversial subjects um, related to gun trafficking and narco violence. Um, so I've basically just been calling this like getting clockwork oranged, where it's like no matter how you try to avoid it, you're just being completely inundated with this flood of really visceral, violent, um, just hate. Uh, and we have another video here. So these death threats continued for months and months, and they still haven't completely um, dissipated, but um, the first couple of months were especially hard. This one's just a guy, like, Andrea Noel, take care. Um, I'm gonna cut off your head, watch out for your family, et cetera. Um, so this is just one example of, I mean, there were literally thousands and thousands of images pouring in um, for, for months on end. I, um, <laughs> we're just going back to that, hold on. So people immediately um, started IDing people uh, online as I had asked them to. And um, ironically, this whole situation with trolls, um, it was immediately attributed to this group called Master Troll, which was a rather successful YouTube channel um, that uploaded these videos of basically just assaulting people in the street for fun and for laughs. Um, and we do have one more video right here. We're gonna be switching back and forth, I apologize for that. Um, so this is kind of what the content looks like. It's just basically assaulting people in the street. And um, there's, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe and put your thumbs up, right? So. That's the kind of content that these guys were producing. And it's highly profitable, these sorts of videos on YouTube. They were never demonetized. Um, and when your videos are receiving, this is a really light one with just six and a half million, but some of them had 22 million before they were finally taken down, mostly as a result of what happened to me. Um, but so it's, it's very profitable to be a troll online as well. Um, 
when, when it comes to YouTube. So I'm kind of, I'm going cross-platform. I'm mostly going to be talking about Twitter um, because that's where I spend my time when I'm not IRL. Um, but then there's also a little bit that has to do with Facebook. Um, my view is that all of these tech companies are complicit and allowing um, all sorts of horrible things to be happening. So what ended up happening as a result is that these change.org petitions started popping up. Um, the first one, oh, so these guys were also given a television show as a result of how successful their YouTube channel is. And in Mexico, as Renata pointed out, um, and across Latin America, <laughs> there's, um, people don't really see violence against anyone, especially women, as a problem. These guys were going around um, like sneaking up behind women and forcefully like making out with them and then running away and laughing. And nobody ever thought, hey, that's sexual assault. Um, what they did think instead is, hey, let's give these guys a, a TV show because it's so profitable and so successful. So this TV show popped up. The first petition is, let's get rid of this TV show. The second petition is have YouTube uh, get rid of their channel. This one is for the authorities to take action in my case and get this guy because, as I said, um, th this is kind of like an open and shut case. It's filmed from 12 different angles. The guy's caught on every video possible, um, easily identifiable. Um, regardless, it's now two and a half years later. Obviously, he hasn't been caught. It's um, one more unresolved case in Mexico where 98% of crimes are met with absolute impunity. So this is not an exception, it's just the absolute um, epitome of the rule. And this is one more petition um, that's hashtag stop the threats and it was kind of a combined peti petition about my case, about threats against other journalists, um, feminists, members of the LGBTQI community, um, what have you. So that kind of covers the hate portion, um, although there's more hate to come. Um, but news, so this became an incredibly viral story and made headlines internationally for reasons that are beyond my comprehension. Um, and for a couple of days, it was just kind of one of those stories where it's like Inside Edition wants to talk to you and all of these, you know, just bewildering um, scenarios. Um, the threats went offline and started to impact me in my, in my home. So I decided after about a week that I needed to leave the country. It was becoming too much. And I went, um, I moved to New York and thought that it was only going to be for a couple of weeks. And I ended up staying for three months outside of the country because the just barrage of death threats and rape threats did not stop. And every week or so, the, like a new wave would pick up. Um, and it ended up, so I stayed three months out of the country and then I eventually decided to come back, but I spent six months in total isolation because I was honestly completely traumatized by what had happened. Um, I'd never really, I mean, I've dealt obviously as a journalist with all kinds of violence and heard people's horrific stories, but, um, when I say it's like getting clockwork orange, it really is. It's like being brainwashed and it's like being um, collectively gaslit by an entire country. So there's a lot that happened in between all of this, but um, after a while, people started to wonder if this was a coordinated attack uh, and it seemed there were a lot of indicators to believe that it was. And um, an analyst in Mexico named Alberto Scorcia um, he, he's now a good friend, but we hadn't met before, and he uh, downloaded about 20,000 tweets that came over the course of about a 48-hour period, and he looked into them and analyzed them and started to kind of explore the networks and how um, all of these people were interacting. Mind you, I was like a nationally number one trending topic in Mexico more times than I can count, 12, 14, 18, 20 times over the course of three or four months. But this is kind of within the first week. It's about two days. And some of it is, you know, people trying to get Twitter to suspend certain accounts. Others are news articles. The guy on top, E.J. Lodena, is a news columnist who wrote an article claiming that I was a feminazi who had produced, I would hired somebody to do this in the middle of the street so that I could push forward my feminazi agenda. 
and I complained about him on national TV and got him fired. Um, so it's just one of, you know, maybe a dozen, no, let's see, about six people who lost their jobs over the course of, because I would not stop pointing out how horrible this behavior was and how unacceptable it was. Um, but in exploring these networks, um, Alberto hones in on a few little bubbles that all of these names I know so well because after a while you get to know your trolls and you get to know who is harassing you. So I've actually spoken to a lot of these people. I've had lunch with some of them. Um, over the course of the past two years, I've talked to more than 100 influencers, trolls, and what we call bots in Mexico, which are not robots, they're actual humans because labor is cheap. So it's cheaper to hire people to act like bots than it is to um, program bots sometimes. So I've talked to a lot of these people um, and know them very well. That's probably enough for this video, we can, we can move on. But um, it's interesting to see how these networks communicate and how they do act as organized um, it's it's groupthink and it's very very finest. Okay, so was it a coordinated attack? Yes, it was. Um, so bots. As I was saying, bots are not always bots. <laughs> Um, bots are sometimes also humans. It's kind of the way that we refer to, we talk about Russian trolls. In Mexico, we would just call those government bots. Um, we don't really differentiate. They're not actually programmed. So the hashtag got started. This is about a weekend. Um, day to ejaculate, ejaculate for Andrea Noel Day. And people acting like bots began spamming with this hashtag, trying to get it to trend. And um, I realized after a while that it wasn't just me that this was happening to. This is happening to all kinds of people, and especially during this period, 2015 to 2017. Um, this was happening almost daily, every other day. It's happening to pick somebody at random, pick a social class at random, pick a marginalized community, pick a skin color, pick a whatever, and then harass them using Twitter's trending topics, um, taking advantage of their algorithms to harass select groups of people. So this is beaten woman is happy woman. And this became the number one trending topic in Mexico, March 19th. That's about two weeks after my situation started. Um, this was 27,000 tweets when I took this uh, screen capture, but I'm sure that it ballooned far beyond that. And these are some of the pictures that come with those sorts of hashtags. You've got um, young women with like bruises and blood coming down their face. One has like slit wrists and they're voluntarily uploading these images um, using the hashtag and these pictures say, my place is in the kitchen, he's always right. He beats me because he loves me. If he doesn't beat you, he doesn't love you. Um, and then there's another girl there who for some reason has sex object day. So this is, volun this is voluntary. This, isn't, um, this is where things get very strange because women um, ha also sometimes are people who choose to participate. And it's very common in Mexico to hear women talk about like, oh, I'm not a feminist and you know, it, it, we're, it's still, it's like a very Catholic country like the rest of Latin America. There's definitely, there's very pronounced gender roles. Um, so this is a little girl. I've blocked out her eyes because she's probably only like 10 or 11. She's holding a sign that says, my brother taught me young that my place is in the kitchen. And I'm assuming that she didn't volunteer for this one. I'm assuming that her brother put her up to it. Um, but one thing that's interesting and this kind of started uh, me on the path to understanding what was actually going on in my case. Um, that girl right there, her hashtag says hail LH. This guy's username is Zager Hulk. So LH stands for Legion Hulk, and Legion Hulk is Hulk Legion, 
And what this group is, is a very, very popular Facebook page in Latin America. Um, when it was last taken down, because it pops up all the time, and sometimes it is removed every couple of months, it had, the last time I checked, a quarter of a million followers. And these are mostly very young people under the age of 18, for the most part, across Latin America, who congregate to share what they call momos, which are like memes. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's not just the Hulk Legion, this Facebook page, because that's kind of like a landing page or a lobby. And what happens is <clears throat> the more that you participate as a member of the Hulk Legion, the more likely you are to be invited into like back rooms. Um, and there's a whole, uh, it's kind of like gang mentality when you're within this group, like you have to participate in certain things or else you get banned um, from the group. So nobody wants to get banned and part of the thing is like, hey, now we're gonna pick on you know, this YouTuber. So everybody go and harass this YouTuber or else you get banned. So these kids don't wanna get banned, they stay in it. The very best of the little child trolls get invited into these back rooms, one of which is Hulk Red. And Hulk Red is a place where um, people, both adults and children, trade child porn on Facebook. So, um, Facebook has a dirty little secret, and that's that there are children who use child porn and adults as if they were baseball cards. And the way that kids used to just hang out in the street and play with like pogs or baseball cards, that's now on Facebook, and they're trading um, child porn. Some of them are children themselves, so it's like debatable whether it's, I mean, it's not debatable. It's child porn, but some of them are children, but then there's also adults, so it's very, very, uh, very turbulent waters. Um, and so just here's one example of like a meme. When you go to your daddy for milk and he tells you to get it yourself, and I've censored a little bit of it, but um, the, that's just a meme. The, within the groups, it's far beyond memes. Um, there's a lot of originally produced content and I've explored the group. Um, every couple of months I'll pop in to see what's going on and if anything has changed. And um, basically they're all trading like mega upload links where you can go in and you can actually see that um, there is a certain, as a journalist I've learned a lot about, um, you know, certain things that are moved on the dark web. Um, there are a couple of like classic well-known cases of child porn that are considered like classics within that subculture. And um, you kind of get to know like who these children are because they're very famous cases. However, what I was seeing in these Facebook groups is that a lot of this was original Latin American content where it's like a guy and his seven-year-old niece. So of course, I've reported this to the FBI, I've reported it to the Center of, of, for Missing and Exploited Children what have you, and nothing gets done. Um, it's obviously outside of the jurisdiction, I would imagine, of the US, and the best that they can do is take a link from you. They, and you know, I've sent pictures of like the faces of some of these children, and this is all just like aggregate trauma, right? <laughs> um, but nothing gets done. These Facebook groups still exist, and there's way worse than that happening in the back channels of Facebook. Um, so the reason that I bring up Hulk Legion is because I eventually tracked down one of the, I tracked down the administrator of one of the, of, of Hulk Legion. There's a couple of administrators, but they're basically like gods within these groups. And they have hundreds or tens of thousands of children at their disposal to do their bidding or else they get banned. So nobody wants to get banned. So I was on the podcast Reply All and I talked about this in great, great detail. So if anybody's interested in hearing that part of the story, I would recommend going to that. But I'm gonna play a little clip sort of as a segue into what I really wanna talk about. Although I do recommend that you guys <laughs> listen to that podcast. Um, but this is where it gets very political. Bearing the bad news, we're kind of fast. No. The techniques for bearing the bad news were kind of fascinating. Andrea got her hands on a bunch of the internal emails where this is described. But basically, if you were an employee in one of these offices, you were given meticulous plans for how to fill the internet with white noise. So in the morning, you arrive at your desk, and there'll be an hour-by-hour -hour strategy beginning, let's say, 8 a.m. We're going to launch the hashtag um, 
happy whatever day it is. Next would be hashtag don't you hate it when, and then would be hashtag my mom just told me, or like hashtag I've never felt better than. It's sort of it's, it's the like same fill in the blank terrible Mad Libs memes that dominate actually like a lot of American Twitter. Yeah. So they were basically doing the kind of work Russian trolls would later do in the American election. Fill the internet with spam and then have a bunch of fake people promoting opinions. But sometimes that strategy wasn't enough. Sometimes there'd be a piece of news that was just too big to drown out. Like when The Guardian released a story alleging that the PRI had been bribing the country's big TV network in exchange for good coverage. For stuff like that, they would create a massive diversion online. They'd make up an event. So, you know, they call them smoke screens, and you can see it, like, bullet pointed. Like, internally they call them smoke screens? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no... They're, they're not shy about the terminology, and they're not pretending, like... I mean, that's the really... The thing that surprised me is how explicit and blatant the language is that they're using. So a combination of smoke screens that can be, like... Actually, I think they killed Justin Bieber when that article came out. They killed Justin Bieber? Yeah, but they've done that a bunch of times. So you can see them killing Bieber th- three or four times. So Andrea actually corrected herself later. It turns out that that time after the Guardian story, they didn't kill Bieber. They just pretended to cancel one of his concerts. Other times he was not so lucky. And if every diversion failed, they still had one more tool. They just start a fight. They tweet some offensive, vitriolic hashtag and then hope that the ensuing argument drowned out any other conversation. So it'll be like, fuck gays. And there you go. And all these people jump onto it. Um, Like instead of saying hey, everybody loves the president and hates his opponent. And you're like, hey, does everybody love Wednesday and hate gay people? And like (laughs) through like banality and viciousness, you can just like flood the room so that no real conversation takes place. Exactly. And so that's the whole strategy. And you can see it hour by hour by hour. So for three months, Sophie... (laughs) So I'm not sure if anybody, everybody got that, but basically... um, the Russian troll farms that are now so popular in our modern conversation about all of these subjects, um, it is by no means anything new. And for me, it was very um, disheartening to hear when Twitter was testifying and being grilled about this subject. Um, They would repeatedly, the legal team would use these words like, this novel threat, this um, new imposition, this what have you. And that is an absolute fiction, and it's an intentional fiction. What I'm saying is that they were lying to U.S. investigators. And um, if they would have just listened to Latin America, if they would have listened to other regions where this has been going on since 2011, 2012, um, year by year, they would have, uh, basically the the Russian situation would not have happened. It would have been absolutely mitigated. Um, But by not listening to the rest of the world, they've essentially um, produced this massive problem of social media manipulation just by omission, essentially. So in The Prophet, I talk about what was going on with like the Hulk Legion um, figurehead. But I'll come back to him in a minute. But... The, the political side of this manipulation is what is producing all of the stuff that I just previously talked about, and I'll explain why, but... In Mexico, as I was saying, we've got bots, but they're not... Sometimes there are bots, but they're mostly just humans. It's troll farms and it's freelancers. In Mexico, we call them peña bots. As I say, they're cheap labor. But a Peña bot is basically um, any sort of pen- uh, political manipulator. Um, our president now, then candidate, when this all began, is Enrique Peña Nieto. And so, um, you know, after, after he's gone, they'll probably still be called Peña bots because he kind of birthed this whole situation in Mexico. So there he is laughing it up. Um, and... So the situation in, in, in Mexico, and it's, if anybody was here yesterday, um, a very interesting talk um, occurred. A very similar situation in parts of Africa um, as what's happening in Mexico and throughout Latin America where the, the free press is really something that has um, struggled to exist. There are very few independent outlets, very few independent journalists, and the way that um, the government purchases silence and omission 
is by sponsoring news outlets, basically having a massive overblown advertising budget and um, shoveling, forking money into these um, news organizations to the point where there are thousands of news organizations in Mexico and local media outlets that would not be able to exist without um, their budget. More than half their budget is coming straight from the government and all that's doing is buying silence. So this is just in the first five years of the Peña Nieto administration, two billion spent to basically silencing the press, gagging them with cash. Um, which is why obviously social media has played a huge, huge role, but it's also the most logical next step for the government that when social media poses a threat and becomes a free platform where citizen journalists and humans, real humans, can um, complain about the horrors that are happening, that becomes the next place to start funneling cash and forking over cash to gag people with their own taxpayer dollars or pesos in their case. Um, so it's been a very effective strategy and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our current administration and how this was birthed because it really is, um, 2012 was the beginning of this whole situation in Mexico. In Mexico we have six year terms, so it started in 2012 and it ends, um, our next election is in about 34 days. And then he's out in December, which is fantastic. Um, so this is May 12th, 2012. It is about six weeks before the election in 2012. And um, Pena went to visit a bunch of students as a candidate he had been the Mexico state governor and um, terrible, terrible things happened during his administration as a, as a governor. So he went to visit um, a kind of middle class privileged university and the kids basically ran him out of the school. He ended up hiding in a bathroom for a while and it's kind of a, one of those legendary moments in Mexican history. And what this ended up doing is it eventually led to a massive student movement. People were calling it, Arab Spring had just passed, so they were calling it the Mexican Spring. That was May 11th when he hid in the bathroom. This is May 12th. All of these newspapers have the exact same headline. This is about 20 different states. Uh, Peña Nieto succeeds at Ibero despite orchestrated boycott attempt. No, Peña Nieto got called out for so-and-so massacre or the raping of women, what have you. Peña Nieto did a great job, fantastic. So this is the problem with um, the purchased press. This actually is um, one news conglomerate um, that made the news kind of fairly recently because uh, one of their executives stole Tom Brady's jersey. Did you guys hear about that story? So he stole Tom Brady's jersey and that's just kind of like the perfect example of the level of just absolute impunity and just how gross these people are. So this happened the day after. Um, it's six weeks from the election. He's got a problem that he needs to resolve. He needs to think of a contingency strategy um, and needs to win the elections basically. So what ends up happening um, I'll come back to that. I've uh, obtained more than 10,000 internal emails from a Mexican troll farm going from 2012, two and a half months before the election, down to mid-2014 when we had midterm elections. And the documents are fascinating, obviously, um, but they reveal the day-to-day -day inner workings of a troll farm and what exactly goes on um, hour by hour, what these strategies are. So this is one of their internal memes. Um, Yo soy 132 is the student movement. Basically there were, a after this happened, um, one of the, you know, the, the, both the political parties and his team started alleging that these were like outside infiltrated they weren't actually students, they were being paid, they were mobsters, what have you. So the students, got on YouTube, collected their student IDs, and 131 students filmed themselves saying, hi, I'm so-and-so, this is my student number, and I am a student. 131 of them came out, produced this video, and then Mexico exploded, and everybody started saying, I'm number 132, as a way to show solidarity with these students. 
And this was the birth of this massive student movement that continued for more than a year and, and really threatened at that moment to, to um, prevent him from reaching the presidency. It was, it was a, a, a very exciting moment for, Mexica, for Mexicans online, on social media, organizing to say, like, middle finger to the government, middle finger to the political parties. It was a fantastic moment. Contingency. This is one of the documents that I, um, one of the emails that I've obtained. This is May 11th. This is 2 p.m. May 11th. It's about a couple of hours after his speech has failed and he's been locked in the bathroom. And this says, kids, since EPN didn't, since Peña Nieto didn't do a good job at Ibero, we have to move this smoke screen make mentions about if anybody knows what's happening or how tough the situation is because there's um, a, sh a mass shooting in Mexico City. Use the phrase shooting in Polanco, and Polanco is like a very, very upper class neighborhood of Mexico City. Um, and it shows a couple of the users, and these are kind of official looking users. One is posing as a news outlet, others are posing as like traffic reports and municipal, you know, like they almost kind of look like government or city usernames. So, so that's the idea is like, get the troll farm. There's more than 100 employees working um, at this point uh, on the Peña Nieto campaign, working out of a house in Mexico City. And their, and their whole purpose is to spread smoke screens, um, produce fake news. And this is in 2012. This has been happening every day since 2012 in Mexico. Um, there have been news articles written about this. NPR has done stories about it. Um, there have been, I mean, it's, it's if they cared even the tiniest bit, they would have known <laughs> about this, and they did know about it. Um, they just have chosen to not do anything about it and to lie to um, investigators and authorities about not knowing about it. So this is um, another one of a bit more of the documents that I've obtained. This is 2013. Um, it's the document's called Contingency Plan for the 21st National Assembly, Assembly of the PRI, which is our ruling party in Mexico. Um, bullet point number four is smoke screens. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of these smoke screens because you wouldn't believe it unless you read it because it really is quite ridiculous. Um, in case there are any external events or subjects that attempt against Cesar Camacho Quiroz, who at this point is the president of the PRI, of the National Ruling Party, um, we've contemplated the, next, the following distractors for the network. Saturday, football. Football is a great distractor. So this is a football game that was planned for strategy, uh, planned for Saturday. It's Cruz Azul versus America. So the strategy is um, the simple fact that this encounter is gonna take place between the two teams um, is a motive to be present on the network as, is, uh, as we're accustomed to. Using the hashtag America Cruz Azul or the keywords America Cruz Azul Therefore, so using this um, this uh, sports event, we can use the following hashtags to create a distractor, developing images from uh, newspapers, national newspapers, where we're commenting on a new line of cement. Cruz Azul is a cement company that also sponsors um, one, of the, one of the football teams. So the fake news that they're gonna spread is that one of the owners of this company has just said, quote, our new line of cement is vitamin enriched. This is just an example of the compromise that Cruz Azul Cement has with each and every one of its clients. We're focused on our workers, our industry workers, our construction workers, um, who like to inhale solvents, inhale our products. So basically they're saying that they've fortified their cement, they've vitamin enriched it, because their construction workers like to snort it, and it's like a good uh, gesture on behalf of the owners. Um, so that's the hashtag, is vitamin and rich cement. And this is on a Saturday, and this happens every day. Uh, this has been happening every day. So it's, 
ludicrous, it's ridiculous, it requires a lot of creative writing, and obviously they've recruited um, a big network of like newly graduated from college, fresh kids who need the money, need the job, and have like a little bit of a sense of humor. Um, so that's, you know, one of the smoke screens. And this is like Sunday, it's the same thing. There's another football game. Um, so they're gonna, let's see. Sundays are an easy target for the creation of distractors because the network is weak and we can um, reuse content from previous days like television programming, like telenovelas, which are very big in Mexico, um, or movies that are being transmitted that day. So a couple of hours before the event starts, Pumas versus Chivas is already gonna be a trending topic. And we're gonna be using those keywords. Um, and once the final countdown starts, we can start to actually make fun of the losing team, generating hate um, on one, from one team against the other, which is gonna cause an encounter on the network between the fans of both teams. So inciting hate and inciting people to start fighting with each other over this football game. And that's explicit, those are their words. Um, okay, so same, red hot chili peppers are sick, what have you. This is a Facebook AdWords strategy. There's the targeted demographic, 18 to 60 years old. Um, and that all comes from those internal emails. Influencers, this is just this Thursday, we're coming up on elections, so this is obviously a fake hashtag that they've positioned in the third, um, in the third point. And it's supporting the ruling party who has no chance of winning, but regardless, they're spending taxpayer money on um, creating these fake hashtags. And um, none of these in Mexico are ever sponsored. They're always um, done through like unofficial channels. One of the ways that this is done is called DEX, which means basically using Twitter's own tools against them. Twitter owns TweetDeck. Um, so tweet decks are a very, very effective way of getting trending topics to trend. And what happens here is that we've got um, a couple of kind of large accounts. Chochos is the second one up there, and Chochos is like a major influencer. He's got, he had almost a million followers. And what he would do is launch a hashtag or launch just a phrase in this, in this case, which is all caps and easy to identify. And his followers would know to pick up on that and start spamming with just this keyword. Um, and then the secondary accounts would kick in. And these are, th so the first couple of tweets come from their iPhones and, and they then kick in with like maybe 30 accounts programmed on TweetDeck to use this spam word. So the fact that they're already influencers um, plays into the algorithm and within 15, 20 minutes, they've got a trending topic and they can do this over and over and over again all day to the point where there have been days where every single trending topic is fake. Especially during elections, you can see even state elections or any kind of uh, moment, uh, moment that's important uh, politically, there will be days when 16 out of the 20 are absolutely fake and are being paid for out of uh, Mexicans' pockets. Obviously playing into all the tropes, there's Putin with um, one of the candidates and Trump as his lap dogs, what have you. And this is Russians with AMLO, who is probably Mexico's next president. We'll see in about 30 days. Um, but basically, it's funny that the whole Russia situation in Mexico has become a form of dirty war. There is no Mex there's no collusion, and as far as we know, Russians in Mexico, but it, it's in and of itself, it's become like a, a, a fake news event that Russians are collaborating with certain politicians in Mexico. Um, and I think we're short on time, but I'm just gonna finish with this one video because this is an interesting video where one influencer hired another influencer um, to use basically government funds to produce a video making fun of one of the candidates in our most recent Mexico state elections. Um, so 
sometimes these are funny videos and sometimes they go viral. And so this is this lady left her post-its on this um, on this document that she was holding up. So next time it's just like it just keeps getting worse. Like there's more and more post-its every time she appears on screen. It's kind of funny. It's well produced. It's short. It has all of the makers of like a viral video, but federal funds paid for this. So that's basically it. I mean, it's short, it's effective, and it just serves to like make fun of a candidate. How much these things are actually having an impact um, is debatable. The spread of fake news is obviously um, one of the, the major points behind all of this, but my concern obviously is the fake news, but it's also just the massive amount of black cash that is being poured into these um, campaigns. Um, the troll farm in particular that I talked about earlier, where I've obtained all of those documents and emails, that was being paid for by um, three presidents of the PRI in successive order of Mexico's ruling party, two of whom are accused, have been accused repeatedly by the New York Times and by other um, credit, the DEA, et cetera, of not only stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from their states and leaving the coffers completely empty, but also colluding with drug cartels and um, taking cash from drug cartels. So there's been a longstanding theory in Mexico that President Peña Nieto's um, campaign and rise to the presidency was funded by this sort of black cash that's stolen from states and very, very likely, at least the trolls in the troll farm, they believe that they were funded by drug cartels as well as the, as the stolen money. So there are repercussions that go far beyond, um, you know, if you think of a meme like this, you might see it, or the guy walking, you know, the Putin walking Trump on the leash or whatever. It can seem kind of like a so what, who cares, inoffensive, ha ha. But there are so many um, lateral factors, especially in a country like Mexico where you've got cartels, where you've got um, the misappropriation of state funds, um, that it really makes you wonder. <laughs> so... I think that we're short on time, but I thank you very, very, oh, we still, okay, that's, okay, well, let's do one more then. We've got one more video um, that I'll, you can just do it with the volume really low down, but um, this is like one, really... Andres, this is an interesting one. This is attacking our current candidate, um, the guy who is very likely going to be president. He's 20 points above in the polls. Same thing as like Hillary Health, if you followed that, but this is saying that he's got like borderline personality disorder, narcissism, senile, inferiority complex. It goes through the whole list, the checklist of like medical diagnoses. And this particular video was paid for by um, borderline personality disorder. So this video in particular was paid for using a very interesting procurement scheme by which you've got one company that's a legitimate company that creates a cluster of ghost companies, fake companies that don't exist, and then they um, enter into public bidding and start bidding against each other for government contracts, advertising contracts, of course, because the government loves to spend money on publicity. Um, so that's how that particular video, it's one of about 40 videos that come from one Facebook, YouTube, Twitter channel. Um, that are being paid for directly with money that should have been going to um, uh, scholarships for science, and instead of going to <laughs> create uh, scholarships for young scientists, instead of going to education, these videos um, were, were produced instead as a result of just major corruption, and, um, and yeah, that's, that's the situation in Mexico. <laughs> Thank you.
What a presentation, and what is, what is very, very interesting is that it's not so far away from what we saw of Kenya yesterday, and, and that the, what we are seeing in the elections in Brazil, in the elections in Colombia, in the elections in Guatemala, it is becoming a really profitable scheme and a really profitable business. And I, uh, first, I want to ask one question of the first part, because I think that it's very important to understand um, I mean, what can we do? And, and that, that will be like, a, my, my three questions will be like a, on, on potential solutions or avenues. Did you find any support or any effective community assisting you? Or did you find any support from the state, any support from uh, civil society, any support from media wh while you were going through this? And how the platforms acted? So the platforms, of course, I never manage to successfully get in touch with because um, Twitter especially is a faceless company. Um, I now am in contact with Twitter um, for completely different reasons, but when it came to actually reaching out to them, um, there's just no way. Um, in terms of the community, I mean, I obviously, I, as a journalist, I have a lot of contacts in the media and there were a lot of people who were colleagues and friends who were very supportive. Um, but then, you know, there's certain people who you think to reach out to um, that can't really do much for you. Article 19, for example, it was spring break, so they were all on vacation. It was bad timing. Um, and, you know, I, I was collaborating with the authorities in Mexico to the best of my uh, ability, which means I went absolutely out of my way, jumped through hoops and spent three months, thousands of dollars, answering every single question possible medical exams, psychological profiles, answering every single question that they threw at me about my relationship with my father, my drug history, my childhood, the names and addresses of every family member that I have. Um, and then they diagnosed me with like, you know, uh, basically like the list that we just saw, narcissism, borderline personality disorder, like every condition that you could possibly imagine. Um, so there was obviously no support from the state. They were supposed to contact my embassy. I don't know if they did. Um, so no, just all alone. <laughs> and and, no. and uh, women groups or anyone that did, they didn't, they lacked the experience, I guess, uh, on dealing with digital issues or, or is it, was it a common thing uh, in Mexico back then? I did get um, great support from a, a couple human rights lawyers who you probably know actually, but some like feminist human rights lawyers in Mexico who have been um, insisting on certain cases of like um, femicides, women who've been killed, either female journalists or they're also you know doing one case where the same political party, um, one of their presidents was operating a sex trafficking ring out of his office and basically hiring people um, to work as escorts and paying them with taxpayer money. So they were a fantastic asset, my lawyers, um, who did this all completely pro bono and just like helped me navigate the really, really confusing, ineffective system. Um, but that's basically it. But we can say we can say with confidence that uh, the, the pro problem has increased and there's still no mechanisms in place to help someone in your situation. Yeah. And um, to move to other question, is uh, I, I was, uh, yo soy 132, so I am uh, 132, and I remember uh, I need internet, internet necessario, uh, movement as well when the, when the Mexico government tried to increase taxes, 2010, massive mobilization, so really, really interesting people in the streets. Is that over? Is, 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 is today a complete lack of trust on what you, we see online and the mobilizations online? Is it, uh, is it, are we hopeless on, on that respect? I've pretty much lost faith because um, you're talking about this period where it was definitely, this, you know, this is around the time of Arab Spring and you really saw it was kind of like a young time for the internet as a tool for social protest. And we definitely saw the impact that it made internationally, but in Mexico, you know, it was a, it was a huge factor. Over the years, um, as the candidates and political parties and government itself have continued to manipulate the internet, people have lost faith completely. And even when 
there is genuine movement and social protest online, it's so easy for the other side to say that's fake, somebody's paying for it. Um, so it's the, the damaging effect is also that it's to the detriment of genuine social movements and genuine social protests because basically we're in, a, we're in a state where you don't know what to trust and everything seems fake. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's to the detriment of legitimate protest as well. And the interesting thing is that, as, we, as you show, the credibility of media is like below zero. And, and so I'm very curious because I am familiar with this uh, hype around verification teams or verification task forces, like similar, like, like, like the, white, the white trolls kind of, that they will spread information, healthy information to cure this disease. Uh, but it's the same, I, I looked at the, is this, Curiously, like it is, uh, like media. I mean, they have an agenda as well, and this this design of trending topics can be hijacked as well. So I wanted to maybe just to share with the audience what is verificado, and and what do you think about it? Oh God. Um, so on on the surface, so verificado is a collective of different people within news organizations, but then also so-called civil society. So you've got um, kind of like the elite of charity world. Um, and they've joined forces and they've created this verification task force just basically on the subject that we were just talking about. Even the act of verifying is also met with skepticism. So they're trying to combat fake news by fact checking. It's almost like a Snopes operation or the way that you know the Wall Street Journal will fact check the debates or what have you. So that's what they've been doing, but it's met with so much skepticism um, because as you said, it's the same sort of players. So you don't necessarily know what the agenda is. Um, and in the case of Verificados, for example, one of the main people who is behind it is the son of a man who the next president of Mexico, most likely, and we'll know in a month, um, has accused of being, against, being behind the dirty war against him. So like these sorts of videos that we watch, the one about narcissism and borderline personality disorder, that's attacking this political candidate who's 20 points in the lead right now, Mexico's front runner. Um, who in turn has been accusing a man, the president and CEO of Kimberly Clark, Kleenex Kotex, um, in Mexico of like funding this dirty war. His son runs the charity, Mexicans Against Corruption and Impunity. And because everything is backwards in Mexico, um, there's this running theory that what if civil society and the anti-corruption movement has hi been hijacked by the corrupt? Right, so everything's backwards, and I don't know if that answers your question, highly, highly but I don't know. <laughs> highly probable, actually, actually the, uh, the interesting similarities with Guatemala recently, it was found that the anti-corruption movement actually hijacked the past election. So we are not far from reality when we hear that. And that's my next point. Uh, so it seems that Mexicans lost trust on the social networks and the internet, and that the, the platforms are doing nothing, uh, but are profiting a lot from it. But um, are, do you think that democracy is, is a risk and that these groups have the, uh, I mean, we are not talking here about Cambridge Analytica, we are talking about something else and something like creepier. Do you think that they have the ability to hijack an election, to, to, uh, to swipe an election, to, to, make a, to intervene in, elec electoral, in the electoral landscape? And, 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 I, and here I want to clarify that it's not only this election is a mega election. It's not only a uh, president, but there is uh, uh, almost 3, uh, mo uh, simultaneously. And at the local level, I guess that the dynamic is different. So I want to. So yeah, it's the most expensive and largest election in Mexican history. There are thousands of seats up for grabs. It's federal, but then it's also you know different house seats, um, states, municipal mayors, you know what have you. So it's a massive election. I am 100% certain that this election is the, the, the um, whether or not it's, it has the potential to be compromised is not even a question. I mean, absolutely, and I'm fairly convinced that there are already operations underway. Obviously, the things that we're seeing every day, fake news, 
um, uh, trending topics, but it's way more insidious and there are tens of millions is probably an understatement, hundreds of millions being funneled through back channels into manipulating the election. Cambridge Analytica, like you said, is a mild situation. In Mexico, what we also have is these um, mini Cambridge Analytica, like Palantir has been pitching in Mexico as well recently. Um, and we've got these kind of little organizations, little data analytics groups um, that are pitting people against each other. So whereas in the US election we had just like these monolithic organizations like Cambridge Analytica, in Mexico there are dozens or hundreds of these little, there's a lot of political strategists and scumbags and sleazy people who are working to pit people against each other and they're making buckets of cash doing this. So um, it's a horrible situation. I've, I've almost lost faith in uh, I don't know, it's, it's dark, it's, it's sketchy. <laughs> well, I, I think that uh, now we open the floor. I think that many people will have lots of questions. And Go ahead. Yes. Well, so there were there were actually there were some genuine moments in the first months of that. So this happened in March, and then in April um, in Mexico, it helped spark um, the largest street protest of women ever in Mexico. And this preceded the mega march in Washington um, during Trump's inauguration by a couple of months, but this was a massive, massive women's march in Mexico that came a couple of months before, and it really was like an unprecedented moment. Um, beyond that, there were a couple of points of, you know, legislation was pushed, however not passed, <laughs> but there were several bills drafted um, and discussed. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely, and it, it also was a moment of like cultural shifts people definitely began speaking out and it did, it did uh, cause a difference in that moment. Um, whether it has like a lasting impact, I don't know. And in terms of the political impact, um, what we do see now that we didn't see prior to this whole situation happening and what came after that is, um, you know, if a journalist or one of these like corrupt media members now makes like a horrific comment or fondles somebody or whatever, there can be like a genuine social media campaign against them and people have lost their jobs for doing horrible stuff and that's stuff that kind of wasn't happening before where you could have like a large um, outpouring of disgust that would actually lead to action. So, yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, um, I wanted to ask about the timing of this, um, like emergence of these trolls and these influencers, because um, I come from Turkey and like I remember this time that I was not that um, like um, um, gadget bound. Uh, I mean, we had the um, Occupy movement, and then I remember like using Facebook or Twitter or like my phone more effectively. So I was wondering if Mexican like Mexican people were like uh, really using the social media and then the trolls somehow started to emerge or like how does that work? Because yeah, I feel like all these like huge movements somehow moved us to the gadgets and now it's like another platform for everybody. So I would say that they 
coincide. And that's part of the reason why I started with the 132 movement, because that is happening two months before the 2012 election. It's kind of, um, you know, people were joining Twitter. People were already on Twitter to a certain degree, 2008, 2009, 10. Um, but it hadn't really been used on a major scale to organize and to um, collectively transmit beliefs and opinions in the way that it, you know, it was mostly used for like a small community to make jokes amongst each other and laugh about stuff. Um, but definitely as we see the rise of like these social movements, that's, it coincides completely and correlates. Um, it's almost like the global warming graph, I would say, where you see like, CO2 and I mean it's the exact same situation. I would say that they absolutely correlate and um, I don't think that there's ever been a moment when there was uh, independence between them because as you saw in those emails, the moment that the moment that the movement was birthed, the exact moment it was birthed, there were people writing emails about how to contain it using social media against a social media movement. So I think that they absolutely correlate. Please, uh, first here and then here, yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, hi. Andrea, thanks very much for your presentation, especially the personal bit. It's nice to see somebody presenting like that. Um, there's a lot of things I'd love to talk to you about. I can't do it in this format because, you know, Mexico is an extremely complex place. I lived there for many years and was assaulted on the street once in a middle class area. But my question is, you know, which isn't clear to me from the talk at all, is what are you proposing um, or what would you like to see happen? Because, um, I, I don't know, just like take an analogy, for example, you know, anti-capitalists might say that, you know, capitalism can't be reformed, it has to be destroyed. Are you suggesting somehow that social media can be reformed? Or are you calling in some way for that? Or, or I mean, you mentioned you know, Facebook not taking responsibility for child porn underground networks, and Twitter obviously doesn't take any responsibility for the bot usage of their network to promote Peña Nieto, etc. So, just in general, what what's what's the proposal if there is one? Thanks. So that is a really good question. I go back and forth um, on my own personal belief about it. I am of the mind sometimes just because I'm uh, viewing all of this with, with a much more keen eye than the average user. So I'm much more overwhelmed by what I'm seeing, whereas other people might not be aware of what they're seeing and know that they're being manipulated. I sometimes feel like it's time to go dark and um, just shut it all off. But other times I don't believe that that's the right solution. And I know that <clears throat> really great things do happen on social media and it's been a very, very um, important thing in my life, especially you know being somebody who's like traveling and not necessarily making or maintaining friends. So there's beautiful things that happen on social media and great things. Um, but in terms of what can actually be done, I think the question is completely up in the air. Obviously, there's the role of tech companies, which is, um, so far they've been beyond negligent. I mean, they've been, let's just stick with negligent because it could get really bad, but um, they obviously have to make the first steps um, towards um, advancing some kind of a solution. Yesterday, a very interesting point was made in this talk that had so many uh, correlations with, with my own. Um, there are a lot of bad governments in the world and, you know, there's certain steps being made by, let's say, Germany or the US or the UK, countries that actually have accountability and don't have impunity as a, as a way of existence. Um, but for the rest of the world that isn't so fortunate to have a, a government that is actually interested or places where the government is the actual instigator of these um, horrific manipulations. Um, it obviously has to be the tech companies that are stepping up to, or the international, you know, watchdogs, um, because you definitely can't rely on government by government or nation by nation to find solutions to these problems. So it's going to have to be tech that figures this out, is my opinion, in terms of what they can actually do. Um, a first step in terms of Twitter, 
um, is I would like to know when a bot is arguing with me or not. It seems like such a basic thing to know. You know, it, on Echo Phone, you can see if you're talking, if it's TweetDeck that's spamming you, or if it's, um, you know, if it's IFFTT or whatever. Like, you, you can know where this is coming from. Um, I would like to see more people verified. Um, not everybody wants to be anonymous. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why um, being anonymous is a great thing, especially for social protests. But not everybody needs to be anonymous, and there are people who would be willing to, like, if there were like a green check mark for human who's been verified. Um, but just that, I would like to know if there's, you know, maybe like a circle grade where this person tweets 75% 75, 75 of the time using their actual phone and is real, or 25% of the time is automated, um, what have you. But I would like to know when accounts are being automated and when they're not being automated as a, you know, there are ways to figure it out, but not everybody is like going to go through the effort of doing that. So that would just be like a very, very basic first step in terms of people not wasting their time arguing with computers and arguing with people who are being paid to um, operate out of like call centers. Um, but I don't know. I honestly, I don't have a, I don't have a perfect answer to that. I think that there are um, tech companies that need to set up, set up panels and step up their game and figure out exactly how to fix it. I didn't build Twitter. It's not my responsibility to fix it. I can just complain about it from my seat. <laughs> okay, we have uh, uh, time for uh, one and maybe two more questions and then we finish. Yes, yes, please. Thank you for your very nice presentation, Andrea. And well, I wanted to ask you, uh, as you were mentioning in the context of the future, near future Mexican election uh, and all these efforts that the government is doing to to influence the news and the opinion of people through social media. And apparently they aren't being so successful. So how do you see in the, ne in the next days and until the 1st of July that this strategy is gonna, gonna grow up and get more aggressive? And if they're gonna manage maybe to be able to turn the election around with all their um, manipulative ways and also other things they do like buying votes and so on. Uh, what do you think is going to be the scenario of in the 1st of July? So I have a theory about this and um, the situation is that in Mexico and you know across the world there are many countries like it where democracy is kind of a euphemism for something that's not democracy. Um, in Mexico we're very used to fraud, massive vote buying, violence at the polls, uh, ballots being stolen and burned, actual voting booths being like picked up with all of the ballots in it and you'll see them like on fire but behind a dumpster somewhere, people with guns coming through and intimidating people into not voting, um, massive corporations and companies colluding with people who are trying to buy votes by giving them like grocery vouchers or what have you. So fraud is widespread across um, the elections in, in Mexico. And it's something that we're absolutely gonna see. There's always, always vote buying. There's always intimidation and violence. We have 100 candidates, 100 candidates who have been murdered in the past weeks leading up to the election, 100 candidates. Um, that's not democracy. So what I actually believe is happening, and I believe that part of the purpose of because they're not changing any minds. Nobody is um, seeing these bots, trolls, troll farms, influencers <clears throat> promoting the spam and promoting this like vitriol and saying, oh, that looks cool, I'm gonna vote for this guy instead. It's not about mind changing, it is about idea seeding, um, calling somebody, accusing somebody of money laundering and then let the people run with that. But it's not really changing, you're not gonna get 3% of the vote or 10% of the vote or 15% of the vote from these kinds of online strategies. What I personally believe like the actual purpose of this is, is sowing a seed where you can say, look at this Twitter poll where so-and-so candidate has obtained 95% of the vote. And regardless of the fact that you know that it's like fake followers and it's absolutely fake, that polling number, um, if you see a trending topic every day in favor of one political candidate and you see that all of the Facebook and Twitter surveys are saying that that candidate is in the lead, regardless of what the mainstream polls are saying, it kind of does set a decent base for were there fraud to happen and if they are successful in um, 
implementing their anti-democratic strategies, which they usually are quite successful at doing, it just lays a proper groundwork where you can argue there wasn't fraud. Look at this Twitter poll. There wasn't fraud. Look at how Mead has been a trending topic every day for the past month. Look at how the ruling party is trending and it keeps trending. Look, out of 20 hashtags, seven of them are in favor of the there wasn't fraud. So that's what I actually believe is one of the, one of the more insidious like backstories to what's going on. It's just laying a, like a plausible, it's laying like a little carpet of plausible um, deniability and all of this. So it's not about changing minds. It's definitely not. Last two questions, please. If there's no more questions, I can ask a question. <laughs> Uh, because I'm very curious, because one of another characteristic of Mexico is uh, the widespread use uh, by state-sponsored uh, surveillance and electronic surveillance and live monitoring of uh, social media of everyone by the government. And there's lots of ca case studies, scandals, and so on that uh, uh, the government, the central government, uses and monitors the influencers and monitors the journalists and everyone, every move uh, on Twitter and so on. And there's also lots of cameras. It's actually Mexico City, is, as you showed, is one of the most sophisticated surveillance systems. And there's also biometric, uh, biometric capture either by private sector and public sector. With all this surveillance and with all this identification and with all these cameras, why didn't they identify your attacker? Because they didn't want to. <laughs> um, what happened is I, the video that I showed, that's a video that I pulled from a monitor. Um, I had two of those videos from different angles. Um, over the course of the following days and weeks, I went with the Mexico City Police. I asked them for their uh, surveillance. They have the, it's called the CC4 system, the C4 system. And as she said, Mexico City has one of, if not the most sophisticated surveillance apparatus um, in the world and it's madly expensive, and it's massively hyped. It's called the Safe City System. So this system, <laughs> when I actually went, they first, the authorities said that um, the video wasn't actually pointing at the street, that it was pointing into like a tree or into the sky or somewhere. But, um, so they said that they weren't recoverable, but then the uh, Committee for Human Rights stepped in, there's a seven day window where apparently like the videos are deleted after the seven day window. They recovered the videos, so while the authorities were saying that they had been deleted, they hadn't been deleted. Beyond that, there were more than a dozen um, local cameras from like a nearby Starbucks and from all these different private establishments. So when this guy ran around a corner and then ran for two or three blocks, he got captured by multiple video cameras. I went with the authorities, we collected, I think, more than a dozen videos in total, I think it was 14 or 15 videos. Different angles, different speeds, all of it. They had every single, every piece of um, information that they needed at their disposal. Um, and my only interest in collaborating with them is that I wanted to do the exact same thing that I did with my video, which is give me the footage, I'm gonna post this guy's photo online, and then I'm gonna carry on with my life and just call it a day. Um, they refuse to ever release the videos. To this day, they're stuck on a CD-ROM in somebody's desk drawer. Um, and the reason that they didn't release the videos is they kept using this catchphrase, uh, chain of custody. I heard the term chain of custody hundreds of times over the course of months. And it's like chain of custody for what? And their argument is that if we ever do catch the guy, we need to make sure that this video hasn't lost our possession um, because we need it to be intact for evidence. So chain of custody, chain of custody. But it's a catch-22 because how are you gonna catch the guy if you haven't shown anybody his face? So the only videos that exist publicly in circulation are these videos that I recovered and I spent, I invested a bunch of my time getting it. So on your, your point about surveillance state, um, uh, within these documents that I um, have, there's actually a really interesting bit that completely verifies, beyond the fact that we know that the government is spying on journalists because that's been absolutely demonstrated using Israeli spyware. Um, there's also, as you said, a social media monitoring and listening campaign that's been going on like as far back as 2012. A lot of these documents talk about how 
you know, there's like a list of the 40 most important journalists, 40 most influential people on the network. And those are a lot of the people who are being targeted by these troll centers. The whole point is, you know, if so-and-so independent journalists post something controversial, you guys are going to be the first people in the, you know, subtweeting this and in the, in the comments. Um, arguing and trying to see, see these ideas and getting into conversations with the people who are trying to share this news or spamming people who are sharing this news with like hate or um, the same arguments. It's all about idea seeding. Um, but that's another major factor of this is like uh, monitoring, surveilling, using public social feeds, but it's definitely, it's targeted. It's not let's hear what Mexico has to say. It's let's hear what these people who make us itchy have to say. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions, we, we finish the session. Yes. <laughs> you know, so just I, I was following your thread of thoughts. So do you think also that you were a target because you are a journalist that is covering, you know, the drug war, politics, gender violence, uh, so you think there was really a reason why you? No, and uh, so I obviously that was one of the first thoughts, but um, another major factor, like as we saw with the vitamin and rich cement, one of the things is that they do like to keep the network saturated. It, we're not always in election season. Sometimes it's just Tuesday and there's, you know, it's, it could be anything. It could be National Taco Day, it could be whatever. But um, those are the days when they really have to protect the network because if there is some like cartel violence in Sinaloa, if 17 people have been massacred on a highway or if you've just found like a mass grave with 200 bodies in it, that's gonna be trending on Twitter. And that's where you need this kind of like day-to-day -day upkeep where it's just network management and you need stuff to distract with. Um, and it can be all kinds of things. Sometimes it's just like pretty kitty or, you know, uh, it's kind of what I was saying in that clip. Like it can just be random stuff or stuff about gay people or stuff about fat people or stuff about whatever, just like hateful stuff. Um, sometimes it's also just like uh, distractors. And I think that um, I was just kind of like part of a distraction cycle, one of many. And... Um, you know, it's, it's a weird response because as a journalist, you would kind of expect the obvious one is like, oh, she was targeted. I don't think it's that. I think that I was just part of like an outrage cycle that's a necessary part of keeping the noise up and keeping the, um, keeping the real news kind of quelled. So there's a lot of this that has to do with just white noise and spam and just making the conversation too chaotic and sporadic for people to actually organize. These are all old tactics, like now they're being applied to social media, but these are all very, very old techniques. It's the same sort of techniques that propaganda mills have always, always used. Um, but a lot of this just has to do with division, you know, getting people to argue with people, getting people distracted by um, like clickbait stuff instead of focusing on violence or focusing on things that um, actually matter. If you can have people tweeting about one chick's underwear for four hours, they're not tweeting about some mass grave in, you know, wherever. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, last chance, last chance. No? Okay, thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, just a, a little bit of publicity, Andrea and uh, uh, MC and others, we are writing a report, more detailed report on the elections and also how to preserve democracy in these times, an attempt at suggesting some uh, potential solutions, and it will be out the next month. So looking forward to share it with you. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, wonderful keynote. Uh, also for sharing your personal experience that I understand, you know, is not also easy to do. So thank you very much. And uh, I wanted to say that we will meet in half an hour and uh, we will have with us the directors of the film The Cleaner that is about uh, also the people that are working uh, on Facebook uh, trying to 
clean it and trying to filter it. Uh, so please come back and we will uh, also go inside the shadow of, of this kind of working situation. Thank you. <laughs>